Good morning. I invite you to turn to 109. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand together as we sing. Great is thy faithfulness. Number 109.
invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 45. We'll be reading verses 1 through 13. Isaiah chapter 45, Cyrus was a king that God mightily used for the benefit of Israel. And um, in Isaiah chapter 45, um, this is the message to Cyrus, and a message that shares a lot to us about the God that we serve. Isaiah 45, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, He has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, What are you beginning? Or to the woman, What have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my Son and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hand, stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts I have commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness. I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord clearly spells out that he is the shaker, the maker, the mover of all mankind in history, and it's of his mercies that we benefit from that, and his mercies are manifested to us over and over again. I trust you'll think of the words of this song as Kathy Harvey plays it for us. <clears throat>
Thank you for that special. Let's stand together as we sing the song, Every Promise of Your Word. We'll have the words for you on the overhead. Every Promise of Your Word. So we 
We ask that you would help us today to know your will and then to joyfully submit to it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems like everyone loves a good story. I mean, you know, we, we watch movies, we enjoy hearing stories, whether they're real life stories that are told, but you know, there's, there's basic premises of stories. There's a problem and different attempts at solution and when stories end good there's someone that comes in and rescues and whatever it is um and and we like hearing about other people's experiences as well and and god has designed us that way and and we sometimes think of stories as as fables or not true but but the reality is um there is an overarching story of all of history, and it's God's story. Amen. And when you start to when you start to see God's story, it it revolutionizes your life. But when we don't see God's story, when when we don't see what He's writing, and the neat thing is, He's writing the story today. I mean, he's doing it in our lives today, and and we're part of the story. Um, that's that's why it's it's so important that we we understand this. Um, tonight we're going to be specifically looking at okay, where are we in God's story now, and and how are we supposed to respond to it? We're going to be in the sense of the sons of Issachar. That they understood the times. In other words, they they understood God's story. What was God doing then? And they knew what to do. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that tonight. But um, this morning, we want to remind ourselves of God's overarching story. In our lessons this week, it's about God's gracious redemptive plan, and that's that's. The major part of God's story but we understand that there is a a cosmic battle that is going on and it is between truth and lies it is between truth and falsehood the truth is that God has a plan and God has a story that he is writing and that he's working out not that he's working it out, figuring it out. He's already designed the story before the worlds were ever formed. And now he's playing it. He's written it. Now he's pushed play. And we get to be part of that. Amen. The lie is, the truth is that God has a story. The lie is that there is a better story than God's. That you can write your own story or that um, we live in a world it's been this way since the very beginning that is scoffing at the fact that there is a larger story that there is it scoffs at the fact that there is a story written by God that that there are things that are happening written by God and it goes clear back to the Garden of Eden. God was writing the story with Adam and Eve. And Satan came and said to them, Oh, there's a better story. God's story said you can't eat of this tree. And, Oh, there's a better story. You follow my story. And they believed the lie. Amen. And the same thing goes on today in nations, in peoples, and in your life and my life. Yes. That, that God comes to us with truth, and we think, well, there's a better, a better way that I can do this. There's a better story. That doesn't quite make sense to me. And, and so we submit our script. We're writing our script of this story. And it's encouraged. 
You can be whatever you want to be. Write your story, follow your heart, and on and on and on it goes in our society today. But we want to lay down some, some principles to help us understand this. First of all, we live in a fallen, broken world. We, we sang, I forget, one of the songs mentioned about the creation groans, quoting Romans 8.22, that the whole creation groans and travails together in pain, longing to be set free from the curse. We live in a fallen, broken world. There is tragedy. There are, is disease, disaster, and death. <clears throat> um, Dale Tackett spoke at a conference in Des Moines. He's the one that put together the Truth Project. And, and at that conference, he said um, he was illustrating the first three points that we're going to mention today. But he said, we live in a fallen, broken world. In 165 AD, there was the Antonon Plague that killed 5 million people. There were only 200 million people that were on the face of the earth at that time. It killed 5 million. How many people are in the United States? 330 million, is that right? 330 million. Can you imagine if 5 million in the United States died of a plague? In, in the 500s, the Justinian plague killed 25 million people. 25 million people, at that time there were 800 million people on the face of the earth. In the 1300s, the bubonic plague killed, and they have no idea, they, they say from 75 million to 200 million people. They have no idea how many people were killed. In 1918, the flu pandemic killed 20 to 50 million people. In 2005 to 2012, the HIV AIDS pandemic killed 36 million people. How many of you were alive in 2005 to 2012? Most everybody here, okay? You didn't know that 36 million people died during that time, did you? In 2020, the COVID-19 death toll worldwide is around 700,000 people. We live in a fallen world that every day 150,000 people die. Death is a part of this world. Amen. It's not anything new. From the curse, it's always been here. This isn't like some catastrophe has taken place in our society today that has never happened before. Well, that's true. Never in history before has there been where you can get a by the second death count. Never before in history has there been where you can pull up a map that shows the heat where, where the virus is the most. That's the, the thing that's different. The, the only difference is we live in a fallen world and we need to realize that. Yeah. There is death, there is tragedy. Apart from COVID-19, there has been untold tragedy in, in the world apart from this virus. Amen. And, and it's because we live in a fallen, broken world and we live with fallen, broken people. I mean, what do we expect from people? We as people are deceitful, we're selfish, we're greedy, we're mean, we're vile traitors. That's what people are. Amen. And, and I'm a people, okay? I know that's not the right English, but, but the fact is, it's easy for us to say people are, people are this. Man, people are crazy. And I'm a people. I'm a person. I'm, I'm made. That's who we are. Amen. We're fallen. And every human being is 
bent to evil. And you and I are bent to evil. And it is only the grace of God that anything good comes out of our life. And, and we are fallen people, <coughs> and fallen people believe lies. Everything comes down to this, truth and lies. God is truth, Satan is a liar. John 8, 44 says, You are of your father the devil, he was a liar from the very beginning. Everything in life comes down to this, truth and lies. So we live in a fallen world, we live with fallen, broken people, and I, every one of us individually, are fallen, we're broken. I need completely rebuilt. I don't, I don't need just tweaked a little bit. <clears throat> I, I took a motor in to have someone look at it, and the guy looked at it, and he said, oh, I think it may be done. And fixing it wouldn't be worth the price of fixing it. He said, I'll take a look at it, and I'll give you a call. An hour, an hour and a half later, he called and said, it's ready to go. I said, what? It had compression? Yeah, it had compression. It just needed the, a good tune-up and the carburetor adjusted. And I said, whew, that's great. Glad to hear that. The problem is with us, we don't need a tune-up and the carburetor adjusted. We need completely rebuilt. We are broken beyond repair <clears throat> apart from Jesus Christ. Now, you think of it, we're in a fallen world with fallen people all around us, so, I mean, why would you expect, but we do, we all expect, they ought to be nice to me. We all expect that, but no, this is a fallen world. Expect the worst and hope for the best. You know, that's my motto for life, all right? Some of you say that's pretty negative. Well, it avoids a lot of disappointment in life, you know? You people that expect the best and... Hope the worst never shows up. You're the one we're always going around trying to encourage and help and, and bless because you're so discouraged. You don't realize people are living in a fallen world with fallen people, and I'm fallen, so we're a mess. We're broken. Amen. Amen. And, and it shouldn't surprise us what we're seeing in the world today. But Jesus Christ has conquered sin Amen. And Satan and death. All this brokenness is from Satan. He lies and it leads to death. It leads to all this brokenness. <clears throat> and we read in, in Romans chapter 6, in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, Paul is saying, Man, who can deliver me from this body of sin? The things that I would do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing them. And he says, I'm a mess. I'm broken. Who can deliver me from this? And then he says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 25, But thanks be unto God, Amen. which giveth Amen. us the victory in Jesus Christ. This is, this is the story of God. Mankind chose sin, fallen, all the world is fallen under the curse. But at the very beginning in Genesis 3, God said, I'm going to send a redeemer. I'm going to send someone that can fix this. And until then, you, you do these sacrifices and, and they'll cover your sin but they won't forgive your sin. And that's why you need to keep doing these coverings for sin. But he says there is coming one who will fulfill the sacrifice. And, and as, as the song that Kathy played, it, it says here, Jesus suffered beneath God's rage. Jesus took God's rage. And in Christ I now live. This is, this is the grand story of redemption. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn there if you would. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> 1 
And in verse 54, the last part of the verse, it says, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us victory and he, he does a work in our lives in the midst of this fallen, broken world with fallen, broken people of who I am fallen and broken. Jesus Christ took all of my brokenness and all of my rebellion against God and all of God's wrath against my sin and he willingly took my place and he offered to me and to you and to the world forgiveness in Jesus Christ so that there is hope Amen. in this fallen yes. broken world yeah. and, in, and in understanding that in Jesus Christ we are redeemed and restored so in this fallen broken condition that I'm born into in this fallen broken world Jesus Christ came and he he brings forgiveness by taking my place and he redeems me buys me back from the penalty of sin paid the price death and he has restored us restored me and you by faith in Jesus Christ back to fellowship with God. That's what we were made to fellowship with God. Amen. But sin broke that. We're in the fallen, broken world. And now through Jesus Christ, we're brought back to fellowship with God. We can boldly go before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because we're made a member of his family. We can walk right in the door. We're, we're children of God. We walk right into the holy of holies. To the very presence of God. He's restored us to fellowship with God. And he has bought us back from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is eternal separation from God in hell. He has freed us from that in Christ Jesus. He has brought us back from the power of sin. Before Christ, I was a broken, fallen person, and I had no choice. All I could do was sin. There's nothing else I could do. And even the good that I did was done from a selfish purpose. I couldn't obey God. But now, in Christ Jesus, I have the Spirit of God dwelling me, and he that dwells within me is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. So now I have a choice. I, the power of sin over my life has been broken, and it's given to me. I'm either going to Romans 6, I am go going to obey the Spirit of the life, or I will obey the flesh unto death. I now have a choice. And every day, every moment of my life, I am choosing. Am I going to obey God? Or am I going to obey Satan? Or self? And, and so the penalty of sin has been broken. And the power of sin has been broken. But we still live in this sin-cursed world. But someday... We will be redeemed from the presence of sin. Amen. No more battle with sin. In heaven there is no sin. And what a blessing to look forward. So right now we are saved from the penalty of sin. We are saved from the power of sin. But someday we will be saved completely from the presence of sin. Someday we will be restored to pre-sin conditions. Remember the overarching story, creation. God created it and everything he made, he said it was good. Yeah. 
but then the fall. Creation and then the fall. And the fall, the effects of the fall are still going all the way up here to 2020, August 16th, 2020. And the effects of the fall, I can guarantee you, it will continue until 2027, okay? Because there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Some of you thought, pastors, name and dates. <laughs> I am. I know. I know there will be another seven years on the face of this earth. I'm not planning to be here for those seven years. But there will be at least seven years from this moment. And in that, the fall is, is at work. But in the midst of the fall, God sent his son. Amen. And he brought redemption. And this redemption has not fully restored us to our original place. But it has set us free from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin. And someday there will be full restoration where we are brought back to where sin at the very beginning, before Adam and Eve sinned, they walked with God. There was no shame. There was no sin. And we are brought back to that perfect fellowship with God. And that's called heaven. And that's what God has done for us. And this is all God's overarching story. And it's made up of about 6,000 years. And he's been writing this story. And you think about it. I don't know how long it was till Adam and Eve sinned, but this is a pretty narrow window over here. The fall is a big window. The redemption has only been since Christ died. So, a couple thousand years, roughly speaking. And this one is going to be forever. Complete restoration. And so, it comes down to... Where am I in God's story? God has designed you specifically, the way you are physically and mentally and everything. God has designed you to be a part of the story. And he has designed you to show his greatness. And, and we know God's fullness in our life. When we submit our script, what we're writing for our life, for God's script. Amen. See, we can, we can set our own script and we're writing our own stories. And some of the things of our stories we're pretty proud of, you know. I'm of this heritage and, and I went back and traced. I'm just making this up. It isn't true about me. I went back and traced and, and some of my ancestors came over on the Mayflower. You know, blah, blah, blah. And we were, we've got all... We also have things of our story that we don't write in our story. Amen. Yes. You know, we, we bury that. We rip that page out of it. And we all have a hall of shame. But we're writing our story and... And we write our story and we make our plans. And it's not just the big aspect of the story. We write down, and it's not really we write it down, but it's in our minds. And this is, this is what will make me happy. This is what will make me happy. So, see, our story goes today. I'm going to go in. I'm going to, this last week, people said, I need to go buy a generator people across the state of Iowa. And they went in, and I'm going to go buy a generator, and I know Baumgars carries generator, and they went in there, and Baumgars were sold out. And so I'm going to go up to Menards, or Lowe's, and they were sold out. And, and it's like, what? This is my story. Life shouldn't happen like this. And while they're driving around looking for it, a flat tire comes on their car. Well, I didn't write that in my story. And, and we get upset because things aren't going the way we're planned. And, and as Christians, we think, God, you're supposed to be here to make my story better. To make my story go nicer. 
This is, this is about me, God. That sounds bad, doesn't it? And it is bad. Amen. But that's where we live. Amen. And God said, I want you to be a part of my story. It's not me being a part of your story. Amen. And God is shaking the whole world right now to say, I'm writing this story. Amen. And are you going to fit in with my story? Or are you going to continue to frustrate yourself trying to make your story come to pass? God says, I have designed you to show my greatness in my story. We ought to be, we ought to be jumping up and down. God wants me on his team. He, he wants to use me. Woo! Man, what a blessing. Praise God. It's not about trying to fit God in us. Now, let me say, God's story, when you submit to God's story, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have your greatest life now. Amen. You, you may have hardship and pain and suffering and rejection, but it will end in blessing. Amen. And all that matters is how it ends. And you look at the Bible and the characters of the Bible that said, God, Paul got the vision. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I, I'm submitting my script to yours. Lord, what do you want me to do? Here's my script. I want to follow your script. And it didn't mean everything went wonderful for him. But he was able to say at the end of his life, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me. Can you imagine? Paul's looking and he's saying, man, what a blessing to follow your script, Lord, and someday to receive a crown from God himself. Woo! Talk about humbling. But it requires us to submit our will to His. And it, it may mean there will be hardship and pain and suffering. And we mentioned an illustration last week um, from Ray Comfort. And I want to mention another one that, that he uses that illustrates this point. <clears throat> Two men are seated on a plane. And the first is given a parachute. And is told to put it on as it will improve his flight. He's a little skeptical about it. He thinks, why do I need a parachute? Um, nobody else on the plane is wearing a parachute. Um, but after thinking about it a while, he decides to experiment and see if it really will make my flight more enjoyable. <clears throat> And as he puts it on, he notices the weight on his shoulder, and he notices he's got to kind of sit forward in his chair. He's not able to lean back because he's got the parachute on, and it's, it's pretty uncomfortable, really. And he says, but I, I'm going to give it a little more time here. And, and then pretty soon he notices people are nudging each other. Look at that nut over there, wearing a parachute. You know, and they're laughing at him and, and mocking him. And, and um, he begins to feel humiliated by it. And um, finally can't stand it any longer. And he slumps down in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it to the floor. He's dis disillusioned and on the verge of bitterness in his heart because he thought, I was told an outright lie. They said this parachute would make my flight more enjoyable. And it has. The second man is given a parachute. And he's told to put it on because in any moment, he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts on the parachute. He doesn't notice the weight of it upon his shoulders. And he doesn't care that he can't sit upright in his chair. 
His mind is consumed with the thought of what happens to him if he jumped without a parachute. We tell people, put on Jesus. He'll make life wonderful. He'll make it better, your trip more enjoyable. And they attempt to put on Jesus, and people laugh at him, and it makes life uncomfortable to a certain degree. <clears throat> but you can be certain of this. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment, and you will meet Jesus. Amen. But it's much more than needing Jesus when you die. Amen. It is being a part of God's story in this life. Amen. Yes. And it's saying, God, I, you're all knowing and I know very little. So I'm going to submit my script to you because you know it all. God, you know what you designed me. I don't even know how my eyeball works, let alone anything else. And, and you know all of that. You designed it. I'm going to submit my script to yours. But see, this is where the battle takes place. Satan's goal is to keep God's work fallen and broken. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And when we reject God's narrative in our life, it becomes all about me. It's my story. And if you don't benefit my story, then I don't have much time for you. And that's the world we live in today. Amen. And it's about me. And, and when we reject God's story, it's all about me. And when, when we as people are writing our own script and people disrupt our script, it leads to complaining. It leads to anger, it leads to hatred, it leads to bitterness, it leads to depression, it leads to despondency, it leads to lack of hope, and it accomplishes Satan's purposes. We're not a part of God's program. We're working on our program, and we want God to help us. It's still my story. It's still my script. And we have the blessed privilege to say, God, it's not about me. Amen. We call it dying to self. We call it walking in the spirit. We call it yielding to God. And honestly, I think there almost needs to come a one-time thing where we actually say, wow, God, my life has been about me and I'm making it about you. But it's an ongoing, constantly God, I'm not writing this script. And the battle is personal. We must, we must continually be giving up our script for God's. In simple little things. I, I, I am going to drive from here to home and it should take me 10 minutes. But I get behind Amish and I get behind somebody poking along. And there's no passing lane. And it takes me longer than that. And I get frustrated. Simple look. Well, God, I'm submitting my script to yours. My script was I can drive to Des Moines, go get everything I need, and get home in such and such a time. And er, never works that way. And we can, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to order on Amazon now instead of doing that. And they said it'd be here in two days. And it took four days to get here. And we're, 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 my script, you're writing your script. Amen. And you know what? Nobody else cares about your script. Amen. And so you have an endless battle. You're elevating your script, and everybody else says, get that thing out of here. It's, it's my script. And, and when you can work together, it's because it's benefiting both of us, right? Except when it comes to Christians... It ought to be, hey, it's about God's script. Amen. And then we can agree on stuff. We ought to. But the problem is, it's a personal battle. And it's a battle that Jesus battled. In the Garden of Eden, what did Jesus say? 
Nevertheless, not my script, but yours be done. It wasn't in and of himself, but he said, nevertheless, not my will. God, it's not about my script. I want your script. And until we come to the point to be a part of God's story and not make him a part of our story, we're going to be frustrated, even as a Christian. We're going to be frustrated. We're going to be upset. We're going to be miserable because <clears throat> we're believing a lie. Truth is that God has a plan and God has a story and he wants me to be a part of it. The lie says there's a better story than God's. Or there is no story. And that's where the majority of people are today. There is no story. It's, it's haphazard circumstance. It's up to you. Grab it and make it whatever you want. Or expect government to do this or that. There is no overarching story. And with that, there will never be peace of mind. There will never be contentment. There will never be forgiveness. And there will never be restoration. Amen. But even, sad to say, many people that have been redeemed are still living a frustrated life because we're still trying to write the script for ourselves. Yeah. We're still trying to follow our script. I didn't plan on this to happen. You know what? I think God said, take this world, try this on. I don't care where you think it came from. It's God using it. And he's saying, try this on. How's this fit into your script? This wasn't, this wasn't on anybody's script. And God's trying to get us to say, man, this wasn't on my script. I'm, I need to give you my script. It's all messed up. Amen. And you know what? I believe God's going to start messing even more with our scripts. Just to show us what we read in Isaiah, I am the Lord God, there is no one else beside me. Amen. You know, he, he said in, in this, and someone wrote it this way, Woe to the man who fights with his creator. Does the pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with him who forms it, saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong. Or does the pot say to the potter, how clumsy can you be? And, and, and paraphrasing the last part of Isaiah 45, 10. Woe be to the baby just born who squalls to his father and mother. Why have you produced me? Can't you do anything right? That's exactly what he was saying in, in Isaiah. He says, who do you people think you are? You're complaining to me, the potter, how clumsy I am. You're griping about what I've done. And he says, I am the Lord God. I am the, I am the story. And he yes. is the story. Yes. And we have the choice either to join him in his story or to frustrate ourselves all our life trying to write our story. And you know what? In Christianity, we have really, across the board, said, God will make your story better. And God said, no, that's backwards. Amen. You ought to be thankful that I'm inviting you to be a part of my story. Amen. And we should be running to God and crinkling up our script and saying, God, it's not about me. It's not my story. I want you. And that's the only way to fulfillment. Amen. So who's going to write your story? Let me just say, you know what? Nobody's going to remember your story two generations from now. Most of you don't even know your grandparents' story 
And just about every one of us don't know our great-grandparents' story. We may have gone back and searched in the archives and found out they married so-and-so and so-and-so and had seven kids and so-and-so. To write our own story is futile and vain and empty and frustrating. Amen. But to let God write your story and be a member of his story is eternal. Heavenly Father, I pray today that there would be in each of our hearts a submission to you to realize you are the Lord God. And that you can do as you please. And that we have this great privilege to be a part of your story. Lord, I pray today that we would lay down our script at your feet. And that we would say, nevertheless, not my story, but yours, God. And not just as a one-time thing, but Lord, that we would learn daily to submit to your story. And that then you would be glorified through us and we would know that the best is yet to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I really am asking you today as God's Spirit has worked in your heart as the instrument begins to play will you just go before God right now perhaps you want to kneel where you are if you want to come to the front and kneel and pray or pray or if you want to do it right where you are God I am submitting my story it's not about me I want your script. I want your story. I want to be a part of the grand story. What is God's Spirit asking you to do? I'd urge you to take action right now. As the Spirit is prompting you, I'd urge you to, where you are, or come to the front and kneel and pray, or however God's directing you to go to the back room, but until we get with God's program, it is going to be frustration after frustration after frustration. What is God's spirit? Are you on God's story? And you know what? It is something that we continually have to submit to. I vividly remember a point, a one-time point in my life that I said, God, I've been running my life in this way but I, I, know what, I know what you want, and I'm submitting to you. And that made a drastic change in my life, but every moment, it's the same battle. I need to drop my will. Nevertheless, not my will, but I'm done. What is God's Spirit asking you to do? Will you obey him? If you're here today and you've never called upon Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, <clears throat> We'd love to help you mention it to us afterwards or even right where you are. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. We'd love to help you. God, may, may we be reminded where we're trying to write our own story. Even this afternoon. Lord, may all these things that you bring into our life, our, our disappointments, our anger, our complaining, our bitterness, our despondency, our depression, all these things are signs that we need to lay our script at your feet and allow you to write the story. Lord, Thank you for your redemption. That you saved us by faith in Christ from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin and, Lord, someday from the very presence of sin. But until then, 
May we joyfully join your story and to be able to look back throughout history and say, what a great God we serve. Lord, thank you that you've told us just enough about your story, knowing how it ends, that it encourages us. And Lord, we look forward to that day. But until that day, may we submit to your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Creation, fall, redemption, and someday Jesus is coming again with full restoration. Maranatha.